Hello students. This video will just touch on the introductory topics of Chapter 4. It's talking about reactions that happen in aqueous solution. So it's so incredibly important to make sure we understand the basic chemistry of water, solution formation, what is the difference between a solution that is categorized as an electrolyte, a non-electrolyte, are there things that are stronger or weaker electrolytes? That gives us a better picture of aqueous solutions so that we can really master the stoichiometry involved, which is the key to this chapter. Just a reminder about the water molecule. We know that the water is oxygen that takes on a tetrahedral electron geometry, where two of these sites are lone electrons, but two are covalent bonds to hydrogen. And we usually look at this as, you know, Mickey Mouse ears, where the um, more electronegative oxygen and where these, um, let me turn up the light there, where um, the electron pairs are, that's going to be the more negative region of the molecule. This is the more positive region of the molecule. But every water molecule can create um, four hydrogen bonds with other water molecules. And those are not covalent bonds, they're intermolecular forces. So when one water molecule um, aligns with another, it's going to be where the hydrogen is really strongly attracted to one of those lone pairs. Another hydrogen from another water molecule is going to be really attracted to the other lone pair. And then these hydrogens will be really attracted to, you know, uh, the oxygen of another, and so on, and so on, and so on. So it's the creation of this really, really strong intramolecular force. Every, every water molecule creates four hydrogen bonds. So there's a great network of attraction, very, very high particle traction between water molecules. But that's what makes water such a great solvent. That it not only has you know, this, this attraction for other water molecules, but attraction for things that are like magnets, if you will. So when a solution is created, we see that, that three things have to happen. And ultimately, that third step is the creation of solute-solvent attraction. Okay, there has to be some reason for water molecules to act and, and surround solute. So, a reminder, a solution is a homogeneous mixture. So, ultimately, three steps occur that lead to an even distribution of solute amongst solvent. What we understand is that each solute will be surrounded by a minimum of three, even four or five water molecules. So if we go from separate solute, let's say sugar, which we know dissolves in water because sugar molecules themselves are polar. And water molecules, we know, um, are polar as well. And remember, the governing rule for solubility is like dissolves like. So a solute has to be polar to be able to make a solution with polar water. However, there's attraction holding sugar molecules together attraction holding water molecules together. So those are the first two requirements that we have to understand, and we'll talk about this more in the solution chapter, but we often kind of take for granted that solute-solute attraction has to be broken first. Attraction broken. Solvent-solvent um, solvent attraction has to be broken. And then the solute-solvent attraction can be created or formed. And this should be the payout, you know. This is the reason why. So in this homogeneous mixture, we're going to have the solute surrounded by solvent. Each of these is called a solvation sphere or a solution sphere, these being the three steps of solution formation 
for salvation. All right, so let's talk about what solvent ends up doing when it interacts with a solvent. All right, well, let's just talk about covalent solutes and then ionic solutes. Ionic solutes undergo dissociation. Okay, that is the breaking apart of the ions that make up the solute by the action of the solvent. For example, if we have sodium chloride, Sodium chloride is a network of sodium and chloride, and sodium and chloride, of course, and so on, and so on, and so on. What we understand is water molecules are attracted. So if this is my chloride, it's going to be, of course, negative. This more positive side of water is going to be naturally electrostatically attracted. And as long as this is favorable, then it's probably going to take several waters, but they are going to be able to tear away. Then the chloride will be surrounded by a minimum of three or more water molecules. This creates that solvation sphere where the negative portion of water would come in and then surround the cations creating then solvation. So it is not a hydrogen bond. Not a hydrogen bond. Now we'll remind ourselves of these. Look at polar molecules. We say they have a dipole, and that just is two poles, a more positive and a more negative. We'll talk about this to come in chapter eight and chapter nine. But these are not hydrogen bonds of forces that are created. These are called ion dipole forces. It's not so important to know now, but we'll talk about this later. We just have to understand what's going on, but it's, it's creation and segregating of these ions. Now, what happens then is these separate free moving ions can then sustain an electric current And that is what makes an electrolyte an electrolyte. Covalent solutes do not dissociate, except for acids. But we'll, we'll talk about them as a whole separate category. So we have ionic solutes dissociate if they're soluble. Um, as long as they're soluble, we'll talk about that in a, in a couple of days, covalent do not dissociate. So for example, um, sucrose, C12H22O11, when that is placed in the water, it's soluble, but you just get smaller individual molecules that are surrounded by the water molecules. So if you have the sucrose molecule, then, you know, whichever is the more positive side, well, that's where the negative waters are going to go, where the more negative, well, that's where the ears are going to go, the Mickey Mouse heads, and so on and so on. Um, not a separation of ions. So this cannot sustain occurrence. So therefore, it is a non-electrolyte. non-electrolyte. Okay, so ionic solutes that are soluble dissociate, covalent solutes, they just break up into individual um, smaller solute particles. All right, but acids. Oh, before I get into that, so the way that we would show, you know, a reaction of sodium chloride into water, um, we could show that dissociation with NaCl solid, and it's the action of water that then creates 
separate sodium and chloride ions. Separate sodium and chloride ions. So this would be the way that we would show solid to aqueous, the no creation of ions, covalent solute, ionic that's soluble would um, show um, these dissociated and aqueous. If perchance we would be asked to do an insoluble ionic, well, we're not going to get any aqueous. That one is going to be solid right back out. So that's the way um, we would entertain that for now. Acids. Acids ionize. That is the reaction of an acid with water to create ions. To create ions. So, for example, HCl. That will react with water to create hydronium ion and chloride ions. Acids are proton donors. So this donates hydrogen to water, and if we would picture a hydrochloric acid solution, it would be hydronium ions and chloride ions surrounded then by water molecules and all oh, heavens, I the ears, the positives around the chlorides and then the faces and so on. And so we can see that acids are electrolytes because we have those free moving ions, free moving ions. Now if we recall there are strong acids and there are weak acids. So that is um, quickly the strong acids, and we just need to know this list. HCl, HBr, HI, HNO3, H2SO4, and HClO4. Hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic acid, Nitric acid, sulfuric acid, and perchloric, these ionize 100%. They are strong electrolytes. Whatever concentration we put in, 100% breaks up into ions. So we'll talk about molarity to come, but if we have a one molar hydrochloric acid solution, we have to understand the one to one to one molar ratio, well, that's really one molar in hydronium and one molar in chloride. It is completely existing as hydronium and chloride, it's no longer any molecules. Every other acid, and there are thousands of them, thousands, are weak acids. So as long as you know your six strong, then if it's not one of the six, it's a weak acid. For example, acetic acid. Acetic acid, like weak acids, only partially ionizes. So, anywhere of 1 to 3 percent of this molecule creates ions. So, if it's a one molar solution, only about 1 to 3 percent. So, we're at like 0 0.01 molar, 0 0.03 molar of ions. So, if we were to draw this, the majority are existing as molecules with very small amounts of hydronium and acetate. Now, in water molecules, of course. Now, there's enough that it's considered weak electrolyte. Make something electrolyte, ions are free moving. Things that are electrolytes, as far as solutions, soluble ionic and 
strong acids and weak acids. Strong electrolytes are going to be soluble ionic solutions and strong acids. Weak electrolytes are weak acids. Non-electrolytes are going to be solutions where you don't have free moving ions like covalent solutes in solution.